presentation without my presentation? Why not? First up, Ilan without any slides, but these will arrive soon. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, we're ready? Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my presentation um, is um, will be mostly, I'll be talking about things which are not lexicography. Um, I've been for many years, at least 20, sort of concerned with dictionaries and what will happen and getting more and more interested in lexicography rather than dictionaries. And uh, I began using the term invisible lexicography uh, many years ago. And my idea was I was moving from dictionaries as a tangible product to something virtual and eventually to invisible because it would be used as um, material to feed more sophisticated systems. Uh, I didn't think about AI then, but that's I had a sort of chart and uh, I, I was using that uh, to come to this. So rather than talk about how does um, what becomes invisible in lexicography, my point is to talk about how do we use lexicography invisibly in new systems, okay? And specifically about machine translation. Well, I was hoping that I can, <laughs> in the meantime. Yeah. We're becoming uh, ever more dependent on machines and all that. And that's part of the thing. So good thing uh, now there's a very popular term about the human in the loop in human machine interaction and i'm very happy that the human remains indispensable yeah, something to hope for okay. hello again okay let's go uh okay i explained uh, my background for that so this is uh, my statement there which i will try to explain why is lexicography still so wonderful and how can it help the world in its horrible state today. Uh, and uh, these are the highlights I'll go through um, to talk about the problems with, main problems with machine translation, um, about some big projects in 2022 uh, regarding multilingual corpora for that. Uh, how does ChatGPT um, help today and then that will be just the, the tiny bit to talk about the qualities of lexicography because I assume most of you are uh, very well versed on why lexicography is so fantastic and how can it help. So uh, my emphasis will be on these uh, machine translation things. Until very recently, the main thing in machine translation has been the neural uh, machine translation and basically based on big data, on uh, that used for training uh, uh, machine learning models. Uh, and that was the base of, of the abstract also that uh, I submitted. Um, but I will also touch about today, there are lots of experiments on use, using ChatGPT for translation and seeing, okay, what works, what doesn't work, uh, et cetera. So basically it's, massive amounts of data and very complex data, uh, large language models and um, uh, cross-lingual exploitation or uh, extrapolation from that using things from one language and working automatically into others. And the big thing here is the quality of evaluation about the results. So um, a lot of the, the data that is used or has been used in neural machine translation for commercial purposes is web crawl data. So uh, first flaw of that is the noise that you need to deal with to clean it up. Uh, there is a big problem is that a lot of the origin of such data actually comes from machine translation data, uh, which was post edited or not. Uh, there are copyright issues and, and problems with uh, uh, terms of use. Um, so this is something uh, which puts a lot of work on post-editing in particular. 
and we'll see it also uh, in uh, the language, uh, large language models as well. Uh, flaws with the grammar and syntax, uh, or grammatical gender, number, uh, wrong verb tenses, uh, co-reference problems, inflections, and misinterpretation. Um, you see, there's, this is just to run through very quickly and superficially and say, hey, there's lots of problems with machine translation. So this is just a, a list which is taken from uh, papers on machine translation, and this, these are the kinds of problems that are, that are found there, and I suppose uh, you don't need me for most of them. Problem like trademarks, Nike Air, so Air is being translated uh, with name entity recognition uh, in all kinds of uh, things like this. Um, and of course, uh, problem of under-resourced languages. Now, there are those who will tell you that all the languages in the world today, except for English, are under-resourced. But of course, there are those that are more privileged and uh, many of those which are not privileged at all. Uh, so how do we uh, find some language equality in that? Uh, there is insufficient multilingual corpora. More and more there is a, a need not just for bilingual parallel corpora, but for multilingual corpora. And uh, the post-editing burden is getting ever uh, bigger. Um, I'll um, go through quickly two big projects. Uh, that were uh, released last year, uh, one by Amazon, but one by Microsoft. Amazon, it's called Massive, and this is the acronym there, the Multilingual Amazon SLU. SLU is uh, uh, speech language uh, understanding, uh, etc. So uh, they have developed a data set, including one million examples, based on uh, nearly 20,000, or actually more about 19,500 um, 19, examples in English, which they have developed uh, very carefully. Um, and uh, it's developed by uh, real people, by professionals. And I will go through, and this is, most of it is kind of copied from their publications about that. The data set is open to the public, not just the data set, also the codes and the models and everything. And they've also had a, a workshop at the end of last year on this massive thing with a shared task, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so their focus is on spoken language understanding. They're starting from raw audio data, um, which they convert to text, which will then be used in NLU. Um, and that serves as a, as a foundation of their training material, which is for Alexa, okay? So the type of, of uh, sentences or phrases that they have there is the, the what uh, is, um, uh, how, what are the things that you will say to a virtual assistant? So it's a specific, type of language, okay? It's not our normal language in a way, or it's part of it, perhaps. Um, uh, of course, such virtual assistants um, are relevant for very few languages in the world so far. Uh, and there are various challenges there on the software uh, side, uh, in addition to operational ones. And, uh, and that is the major concern in creating massively multilingual NLU models um, in the lack of training and evaluation data. So they went and they developed that data. That was a big project that they did, getting these uh, nearly 20,000 20, what they call utterances and having them translated by real translators into 50 languages. So they created a data set of one million uh, sentences altogether. Uh, um, a phrase or a sentence with its translation is referred to in machine translation as a segment. Okay, I will use this term. 
so uh, they have a whole description of how they decided on which languages. They wanted a, a fairly diverse uh, selection, uh, both as regards different language families and scripts as well. Uh, so you see they have 14 uh, language families altogether, 21 uh, different scripts. Um, and uh, this is uh, uh, what is interesting about what these utterances are. So it's mostly interrogatives, questions, and imperatives, which are commands and requests. Basically, you will not tell your virtual assistant, okay, I'm going shopping now, you know, this is not the kind of language that will be done there. Uh, so um, there are pol uh, politeness things and moods and, and names and lots of things that go into that. And I see also that uh, for some reason we don't see what's there below. So I'll just move on. This is the data set developed by Microsoft, uh, which is based on uh, actually news um, uh, corpora. Again, it's all from English to other languages. We're still looking at the world with English glasses and uh, adapting to other languages from there. So they used altogether uh, nearly 2,000 sentences from 123 documents, altogether 42,000 words. And um, it's Generally, there is a lot similar with the Amazon experiment. Um, and uh, they also insisted on translators who are, I didn't mention also same with Amazon, who are native speakers of the target language and fully bilingual and professional bilingually. And making sure that they did not allow to use anything coming from existing material from other machine translation that was post-edited post uh, in order to create a data set that can be used for testing and evaluation machine translation systems. So each of these giants created their own data set uh, to use it for specific purposes. One in order to train Alexa particularly, and the other in order to use it for testing results of machine translation, using specific languages and insisting on the human factor in that, okay, which is very encouraging. I think it's very encouraging for us because, oh, I forgot to move on with this. Um, yeah, these are more or less the things uh, I was telling you about. And I think uh, here too. Um, okay, so I will move on. Why is it so interesting for us? Because we're in lexicography. And this brings us to ChatGPT. Uh, and um, I'm just kind of summarizing uh, these recent months of what's been going uh, in with machine translation companies. And basically, I heard them say that garbage in, garbage out. So, which makes sense, right? I mean, what you feed the language model with is what it will know and according to that give results. Now, we all hear or know about how wonderful ChatGPT is and, and how fluent the language that it gives. But here, there is the problem of hallucination. It, uh, it uh, invents things which are not always uh, loyal to the uh, origin. Thank you. Um, and this is part of the problem that actually the, the text that comes as a result from the translation you run with it is very fluent. But sometimes it's about something else. And they must go back and go over it in order to make sure that actually it's a translation of the original text that they threw in. So this fluency is, is becoming so uh, deceptive and again requires post-editing. Post -editing. So they're starting to talk about the importance of pre-editing and the importance of the monolingual data that goes there. And again, great, here we are from lexicography. This is what we know uh, to do. 
because we begin by exploring the language very deeply, mapping it into the different elements, looking at all of these different components, and what is the most relevant, I think, for machine translation is the examples of usage going back to uh, English monolingual learner's dictionary between the two world wars, work done in Japan especially, Harold Palmer, uh, A.S. Hornby, uh, who put an emphasis on patterns, on preparing examples of usage that show linguistic patterns and on phraseology. And um, that was good for learning the language and that is good also for training these models. Uh, another thing which uh, is quickly uh, connected to that is the domain classification. If we have the entry for bank and uh, the financial sense has the domain finance, it's already part of, of that world. So um, this is the first place where I think that lexicography can be very useful for machine translation in providing these segments which are based on, this, uh, on these examples, which already incorporate patterns, whether it is uh, those that were uh, uh, inspired by the, by the uh, pioneers in Japan and India, or those spoken by uh, Patrick Hanks uh, today on pattern lexicography. And once we have the monolingual layer, we go and translate and develop bilingual and multilingual layers. Uh, and we, of course, involve experts in doing that. Uh, we develop bilingual and multilingual corpora. We have domain attribution. And our data is state of the art. We have really good data that's easy to work with. And it can also be used for text to machine because we have also um, uh, phonetics, etc. So this is just a quick list of um, main components that we're into when we're preparing uh, a monolingual lexicographic set. Um, and um, we begin with a monolingual. Once we have a good monolingual base, we, the sky is the limit. We can go make a bilingual and another bilingual and another one and making it a multilingual network and then cross-lingualizing that, basically aspiring to go there where any language can be at the center of the universe, speak its own language, so to speak, and connect with any other language. So this is um, a, a, just a sample of a multilingual parallel corpus um, where the same example is being with its equivalences in other languages. What you have here in blue, uh, the French, well, uh, just see the FR, uh, that the, happens to be the origin of that, okay? And not all of that was actually direct um, translated there. Here, this is from a certain, it's simply a word which has the domain uh, of uh, uh, finance, and that comes from German in the equivalence here. Um, I'll take maybe two minutes because uh, I started a bit late, okay? Um, and, but I'm nearly finished. Uh, I'll, just the use case we've had with that was developing four bilingual parallel corpora for Korean and four major European languages, altogether over 260,000 uh, segments, uh, about more or less even for each language pair. Um, so we were using the examples and their translations, and we look at things uh, as three different types. One would be the translation from language A to language B, another what comes from language B to language A, and another are those that were not translated directly, but, but uh, were there because, let's say, from what you saw there in the uh, French, so we take the, let's say, Portuguese and the, I don't know, uh, uh, Japanese and put them together, and both of them had a, a third pivot language. Uh, so when we did that, only the English to Korean, uh, most of it was translated directly. All the others were not. They were these type three 
segments. So uh, first there were some uh, tests on that and as you can see between 6 to 19 percent depending on the language pair were not perfect in their uh, equivalence. And for those we sat and reviewed each and every one of them and made the corrections as far as they were necessary and when it was finished, these are the results that you see at the bottom. There were just some uh, human typos in very few of those translations. Uh, those are my references, and this is my thank you. Thank you, Ilan. Um, one longer question or two short ones? Are there any questions? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, just regarding ChatGPT, do you also find that its translation skills are much worse than its ability to speak, I mean, to write a language uh, without translating? I definitely find that if I ask a question in English and say, please answer me in Danish, the Danish is much worse than if I ask a question in Danish. So I think there's something going on behind the scenes there uh, that means that you have to be really careful about using it as a translator, but perhaps you can use it in other ways. I mean, do some tricks to make it, I mean, perhaps go two steps and first translate your question into bad Danish and then have it asked in, in Danish or something. I'm not sure what exactly, but do you think there is something there? Thanks. It's a great question, and I ask that as well. I'm really not an expert on that, but it's things that what I'm hearing, and, and my conclusion is, and, and I, I hear from these experts who are beginning to say, number one, monolingual is important. Uh, number two, large language models are too large. Uh, also, it's, it's so expensive to rush, run such a huge thing in order to have something specific and focused. But also what we need is more compact models that are dealing with what we need. Now, I think they are used, usually it's American companies, they are used to uh, dealing with English. This is my interpretation. So naturally, they are dealing with that. I tend to assume, but this is a, a guesstimation, okay, that absolutely, if you give them good data to train their models, I mean, the models will give you what you train them with. So if you uh, give them healthier food, they will give you healthier results. It, it just makes sense to me. But I think this is just at the very beginning. The whole thing is just several months old. Let's continue with a question from the online chat from Anna Frankenberg Garcia. Thanks, Ilan. Could you comment on any problems of translation directionality? For example, French to English is not the same as English to French. Thank you, Anna. Absolutely right. Uh, we have taken a shortcut on that. Uh, but uh, yeah, we are aware of it. That's why we do divide it into type one would be the English to French and type two French to English. And of course, they are not the same. Uh, right now, it's, it's better than not using that at all. But eventually, when we can afford it, we would definitely like to, let's say, take the uh, French to English. And uh, if we'd like to use it for English to French, to also review it and probably revise what is necessary. Thank you. Thanks again. Um, you see that I took away a few minutes from the transition period. So now we are going to make the change. Ex uh, excuse the problems again. And thanks, Ilan. <laughs>